All right, well, let's start. And I'd just like to say thank you to Wayne for helping us with our housekeeping yeah, on. Yeah. And we want to go into mute. Do we all want to go into mute now, Wayne? Or well, is yeah, that the I mean, recommendation? I, I, can, I can mute everybody, but uh, then, yeah, anyway. You... Because we'll, we'll, we'll unmute when we come and uh, have the opportunity to talk and have a conversation with Ian Dunlop, who's our wonderful guest speaker today. So, look, thank you, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm Janine. Janine Kitson, and I have decided I want to stand as an independent candidate for the federal election of Bradfield. And Bradfield is the um, includes the suburbs of northern Sydney from Chatswood to Asquith, past Hornsby, Castle Cove, and east west St Ives to West Kimball. So, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the land of the Daramaragal people and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person attending tonight. I wish to acknowledge the Uluru Statement from the Heart that calls for the establishment of a First Nation voice enshrined in the Constitution. The Uluru Statement highlights the importance of First Peoples sovereignty and how this is something that will make a fuller expression of our nationhood. As well, I would like to encourage you, if you have a chance, to go to the Australian Museum and see the exhibition Unsettled, which is a really important truth telling about our history and the tragedy of dispossession, massacre and genocide a very moving and important exhibition. So thank you to coming joining my first Zoom event. And we're going to be talking to Ian Dunlop. Um, thank you to also to those who attended the first film event I had at the Roseville Cinema a couple of weeks ago, where we showed the film, The Weather Diaries, which is a really uh, moving film of climate grief made by local filmmaker, Kathy Drayton. And at the end, we had questions, including Kathy and Nancy Pallon, the chair of the Green Guy Back Conservation Society, and Ian. We only had a very short time. And tonight, we're going to continue that conversation with Ian. I thought it would be really just as a little reminder to show a short trailer of the film The Weather Diaries, because it's that message of ultimate climate grief and despair unless we are really strong and decisive in our action that we really need to um, be reminded of. So Wayne, can I hand it over to you to on the trailer now, please? I think that feeling of well, like nothing matters because the world's dying anyway. It's really common <laughs> with people my age. Imogen began wearing this Princess Mononoke costume when she was eight. She wore it every day for the next four years. The whole energy of the wolf girl wanting to protect these amazing animals, that really resonated with me, even though I was really young. It's a huge thing that you and all your generation are growing up with. A lot of us will be affected. It's sort of harder to be hopeful. It's not like we can stop climate change. Sometime this century, these animals will go functionally extinct. We live every day as if nothing's changed. Do it just one more time. As if the lives of our children will be unharmed <laughs> and similar to our own. It's just really overwhelming how out of control things are. Like the bats. In a warmer world, they will also die faster. That one's dead. Right. You can't treat nature like that. School has been hard for her. Why should I even try to have a future? Changes aren't going to happen until people really start to hurt. I can't imagine being an adult in this world that's deteriorating. Getting Imogen through this last year of school is not going to be easy. I sort of just, <laughs> just shut down at that point. One high school student's life is probably about to change. If this species can acclimate, it change its physiology to cope with that warming, perhaps it will survive. I think 
if you give up on everything, those feelings will get worse. As a parent, I just can't let it go. One bed at a time. I feel like if I can do anything to change anything, it's probably going to be through music. We're going to build a better town now. Okay, thanks for that. And um, it does really take your breath away when you do watch that film, just how serious it is. And that's at a really emotional level with a lot of issues about biodiversity collapse as well with the flying foxes. But now we're going to continue it and we're going to hear from Ian Dunlop, who is really a world authority on climate, as well as being a resident of Bradfield. So we're incredibly lucky to have Ian offer to run this Zoom talk. And um, some of you may have seen him uh, in the 7.30 report special climate emergency program that was aired in July, and that's on IU. He's very active now as a member of the Australian Security Leaders Climate Group. But also Ian has a record as being a long time ago employed as the chair of the Australian Coal Association. So there's no one better to, uh, for us to talk to about this really important issue. So I now, with great pleasure, hand it over to Ian. Okay, th well, thank you very much, Janine, and thanks very much for the invitation to talk to you this evening. Um, what I'll do is just um, use a few slides. I uh, probably keep this fairly short and then we can concentrate on questions and answers and so on. So if I can share my screen, if this works, uh, Wayne. Yeah, here we go, I think. Whoops, sorry. Started at the wrong end, sorry about that. Okay, well, what I'd like to talk about is um, not really what you hear from the media or our politicians um, on climate change, but what the science is really telling us. And um, this is orientated around the Paris Climate Agreement, which as you probably know, the key numbers that are being <coughs> thrown around the place, the fact we have to try and keep temperatures, the average global temperatures below two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. And ideally to aim not to increase them more than one and a half. That's the um, key parameters that are being used in the lead up to the Glasgow um, summit in November. So I'd just like to really talk you through what that actually means um, in the way the science is actually representing it. This is a bit of a, it looks a bit complicated, but it's um, just to simplify it, whoops. All right, it is jumping where it shouldn't be. If you look at that um, set of graphs on the right-hand side there, those blue background lines are all a number of um, modeling runs that have been run <clears throat> by one of the world's leading climate groups. And the three dotted black lines are essentially the three groupings, key groupings that um, you need to look at. The upper one is assuming that emissions, uh, carbon emissions into the atmosphere, which are causing global warming, actually don't peak. The middle one is if we have the cuts that were agreed in the Paris Climate uh, Agreement in 2015, uh, plus a bit of later action. And the bottom dotted line is essentially if we move to rapid emission reduction. And what this is really telling us is that if you look at um, over time on the bottom axis here, um, and you look at the increase in emissions going up the vertical scale, the numbers, um, the purple number, one and a half degrees, two degrees, and so on, are the temperatures we reach. And what it's really saying is that under all those modeling runs, we're gonna reach one and a half degrees C by 2030 irrespective of any changes that we make in the meantime. 
In other words, it's pretty much impossible to stay below one and a half degrees C now. The, <clears throat> and this is on the current pathway we're following. The two degrees C um, will be with us by about 2050, unless we really start to move extremely quickly <clears throat> on cutting emissions back. And if we don't do very much, then three will be here by 2060 and five degrees C before <clears throat> 2100. And that's the sort of picture if we don't really move to very rapid action. The if you look at the summary of that science, what it says is, okay, one and a half, we can't do anything about, even though we're being told we still have to aim to stay below it. Um, two is likely by 2050, even with actions that are better than the current Paris commitments and three degrees C in the early <clears throat> to mid uh, second half of the century with five, five degrees beyond that. One of the problems we've got is that the, even if we make significant reductions in emissions in the next few years, the warming trend is not going to be markedly altered because what we're doing, if we pull emissions down, but at the same time, we're also reducing the amount of aerosols in the atmosphere, which come from burning fossil fuels, uh, coal and oil, not, not much gas. Um, and those aerosols have actually been cooling the planet relative to where we might otherwise have been had we not been using fossil fuels. And the two things offset one another, so uh, we won't get a, an overall great deal of benefit, even though we must keep on trying to reduce emissions. Now, what these temperatures mean, I mean, they're global averages, and it doesn't sound a lot, but the actual um, land temperatures will be quite significantly greater than that. But the 1.3 is already dangerous. Um, we, that's what we've already seen up to date. Um, two would be extremely dangerous. Three becomes catastrophic in terms of um, impact. And four degrees C is basically unlivable for large parts of the world. In other words, areas of the world will become uh, uninhabitable. The other dimension we have to think about is that climate doesn't move in a steady linear sense. Um, related to the cumulative amount of carbon you have in the atmosphere, we may reach the point where at certain stages you get a sudden jump, a non-linear jump, um, where changes become uh, irreversible and potentially self-sustaining. And that's what is termed, we talked about around the so-called tipping points in the um, global system, which I'll come back to in a second. And they could start occurring, we're not sure when, but they should start occurring somewhere between one and a half and two degrees C. Uh, there is even a risk that we may have even triggered, triggered some of these, but it's the sort of stuff you won't know until far later. You're not going to instantly see that happening. It may take you know decades for things to occur and even longer. So what are we talking about here? Well, it's this sort of stuff. Um, there's about 15 of these points that were identified around the world uh, quite a long time ago now in 2009. <clears throat> and it's things like the uh, boreal art, <clears throat> forests in the Arctic, the Greenland ice sheet, um, Arctic sea ice, permafrost, things I've shown here. Now, the ones that essentially are very close or past tipping points are the Arctic sea ice, the West Antarctic ice sheet, and the coral reef systems around the world. The ones where there's growing evidence that these may be starting to occur is Greenland, which is linked into the reduction in the Arctic sea ice. Um, likewise, the thermohaline circulation in the Atlantic, which keeps Europe warm. Uh, the Amazon rainforest and the East Antarctic basin. And then there are signs that um, the yellow ones here, the permafrost and the uh, boreal forests in North America are also starting to move in that direction. So these are things that we really don't want to see happen. We really must do everything we possibly can to avoid that occurring. And part of the problem we have is that um, we know very little about the way in which these things will occur. They're not actually included in the scientific analysis that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which uh, does most of the, or puts together the sort of key summaries of this work, um, carries out 
and has carried out so far, they're talked about in qualitative terms, but we haven't been able to quantify them because we actually don't know quite how it's going to happen. So you have to uh, look to take a very precautionary approach to try and ensure, ensure we don't actually reach that point. So what that's, uh, the, the experts on this say is, look, the evidence from these tipping points alone suggests we are actually in a state of planetary emergency, which is consistent, obviously, with the concerns that we've seen over the last few years as emergency has been accepted as a sort of position we're in. So both the risks and the urgency of this situation are quite acute. And if, if these sort of events can cascade, which is potentially the way they might go, um, we can't rule out rule them out, then you have a genuine existential threat to civilization. In other words, civilization as we know it will not be able to continue in the way that we've been accustomed to. So the policy implications of that are that we can't stay below one and a half. And actually, Australia was already one and a half um, in 2019. Uh, two degrees is likely by 2050, unless we move to much more rapid action than we've seen um, being talked about so far. Um, everybody is now congratulating themselves on accepting a target of net zero emissions by 2050, even though our government has not yet <laughs> reached that point. Um, but this is happening with business, it's happening with investors, it's happening with other governments around the world, but it's totally inadequate. We have to do things far more quickly um, than that 2050 timeframe, ideally by 2030, which is a massive task, quite different from anything that is being talked about officially. Now, I mean, the, the government's first priority should be the security and prosperity of the people. And the climate change is now the greatest threat we face. And that threat's immediate, not years ahead. And one of the reasons for that is that the um, climate system has an inertia in it. In other words, you don't see the effect of putting more carbon into the atmosphere for quite some years ahead. So what we're seeing today is the result of emissions we put up there um, you know, a decade or two decades ago. And you're not quite sure what those extra emissions are going to <laughs> result in, you know, whether it's going to cause tipping points or otherwise. Um, we already know that the uh, atmospheric concentration of carbon is far too high. It's about 420 parts per million today, just of carbon dioxide. And if you include the other greenhouse gases, it's about 500 parts per million. And we know that has to be reduced down to a more stable 350 in terms of CO2. Um, we have uh, some means of doing that, but the technology is really in its infancy. And that's a task we have in addition to actually stopping emissions and putting more up there today. Now, we don't hear any discussion about this in Australia. I mean, this is uh, our emphasis is all about whether it's coal or gas or renewables and um, stopping emissions increasing. But this is another task, which is in itself a massive one. The other dimension to it is that because of the speed at which things have been happening, we may have to resort to trying to cool parts of the planet while some of these other changes are actually taking effect. Because um, we basically spent too long arguing about the issue and done very little. I mean, in effect, We've spent 30 years talking about climate change since this first came up in 1992 uh, with the formation of the UN uh, panels and so on. And we've actually achieved precisely nothing in terms of cutting emissions. They're still going up at worst case levels, worst case scenarios. So we may have to take some um, extra steps to handle that, which I can talk about later. So what actions do we take? Well, what we have to do is to recognize that there are a lot of lessons to be learned in the pandemic. And we've been, societies who've been successful have listened to what the science is saying. Um, and it becomes the highest priority to solve that problem. Now we did pretty well in Australia to begin with. We've fallen a bit behind with vaccinations and I think we're falling a bit behind even further with uh, the sort of responses that we're seeing politically. But essentially, we must base the climate change response, which is a much bigger threat than COVID, frankly, 
on the same thing. It's got to be based on the science. It's not just another item on the political agenda that we can play games with. It's a genuine existential threat in a form that we've never ever had to deal with previously. And I don't think, I don't think people really understand that at the political level at all yet. So the points we, we have, <laughs> the action we have to take is one, we've got to be absolutely crystal clear about what the risks are, which we haven't been. Second, we've got to recognize that this is going to require a response, which is a bit like wartime. I don't, I don't particularly like the analogy, but you are gonna to have to turn the economy around on its head in a, in a very short space of time, which is the sort of thing you do when you're facing a sort of wartime threat. Um, we have to move far more quickly than trying to reduce emissions by 2050. Uh, 2030 is the ideal, if we can do it, we may not be able to, but we have to try. It does mean that we have to stop all fossil fuel expansion, whether it's coal, oil, or gas, and rapidly reduce the current use of fossil fuels. Now, fortunately, the International Energy Agency has come out just last week and uh, confirmed that that indeed is the action we have to take. So it's not just people like me talking about it. Um, we've got to build that capacity to pull carbon out of the atmosphere, and um, there are ways and means of doing that but we've got to do it faster than we, they can achieve at the present time. And then we've got to look carefully at whether geoengineering down parts of the planet while this is all happening. So on the positive side though, what we have now are solutions which are probably far more effective even than a couple of years ago in terms of renewables, solar, wind, and so on, uh, a number of other areas. So the cost of doing this is actually much less than it was um, you know, a few years ago. Uh, in fact, it's, it's more attractive to go this route than continue to use fossil fuels now. But what we have to have is a total, a whole of nation approach. We've got to get all of the players together at government level, whether it's um, federal or state, and certainly in a corporate and, uh, or a business and investor sense and the community to focus, focus on actually achieving that. And obviously we're not yet at that point. And I think one of the problems is the fact that there's a lack of imagination within our leadership um, to understand that. I mean, you go back to the global financial crisis in 2008 and the Queen paid a visit to the London School of Economics and said, look, you know, all you economists are sort of talking about the fact that everybody knew about all this stuff. Why did it actually happen? Why did nobody foresee it? And it took about a year before the um, British uh, Academy came back to her and said, well, look, the problem really was the psychology of denial gripped the financial and corporate world. The failure of the collective imagination of many bright people to understand the risks to the system as a whole. And that's exactly what we're seeing with climate. There's not the leadership that is really understanding the extent of the problem and recognizing that it's their role to actually do something about it. So I'll just sort of lead it there just with one quote from Sir David King, who is the previous chief scientist of the UK and was their climate envoy for many years, one of the architects for Paris Agreement. And David's spoken at one or two of our conferences that we've organized here in Australia. And what he says is, look, what we're gonna do in the next three or four years is going to determine the future of humanity. We either get on top of this, we have a um, absolute preparedness to make sure that now they're now put in place. And if we're going to do that, it's going to mean we need leadership of a different kind from the one that we've seen so far, certainly in this country, and I think internationally, is it needs a, an absolute acceptance of the um, threats we face, uh, an honest determination to face up to those, and then the pulling together of a, a concentrated effort nationally to address them. I think the community is going to be particularly important in that sense, in getting that, um, that voice raised. We've already seen it with the school children, but it needs far more of us now to be speaking out and effectively demanding action. So look, I think I'll leave it there. There's a whole lot of questions obviously in behind that, but uh, happy to kick those around and um, the solutions and problems and so on. So thank you, Jeanette. Um, I hope that makes sense.
<laughs> All right, well, thank you, Ian, because it's really important that we have someone who can speak so eloquently about the science and look at us in a really truthful way, explaining to us that we really have no choice to act. We now got this forum and we're opening it up to questions or um, to ask Ian because this is our opportunity. So I was wondering if you want to use your little, uh, put your, raise your hand or put your hand up if you have any questions to ask Ian. Um, Bob Thilkson. Um, good evening, uh, everybody, and good evening, Ian. It's uh, really pleased to be able to participate in this. Uh, I have read. Um, a number of your uh, writings on the topic and uh, was in immediate agreement <laughs> with what you had to say. Uh, so we're actually, uh, I'm in Goulburn, which is where a certain energy minister lives. <laughs> um, we're the best of friends, I hasten to add. Uh, we're, we're running a project which is uh, under sort of land care, but it's, it's to, to um, improve the soil, increase the moisture, on farms through regenerative farming and also do similar things in private gardens. So my question um, or initial question is, because um, you didn't mention the potential of drawing down carbon through regenerative agriculture, which is gaining quite a lot more attention. Yeah, look, um, I skimmed over <coughs> the talking the detail of solutions, uh, Bob. Um, regenerative agriculture is critically important. There's no question that it can make a very big difference to Australia, and we need it anyway because of the depleted state of yes. our Yep. Yes. The problem we have immediately is the most critical issue is to get emissions down fast. And regenerative agriculture will contribute, but it's not going to deliver the scale of the drawdown in the time we now require. We have to really- yeah, sure, you gotta do look, both. We've got to really look at trying to reach net zero emissions by 2030. Uh, these agricultural processes take a lot longer than that to have full effect. So I think it's absolutely critical that we uh, develop them and implement them, um, but we've got to do a hell of a lot more than that. And the only thing you can do is to see the uh, reductions come from the big emitters. I mean, the oil and gas companies and so on. These are the ones that are absolutely critical in the short term. Agriculture has got to come in behind that because that's part of the process of drawing down from 420 to 350 parts per million. Um, and, but you just have to be brutally frank about the, the short term urgency of action. Yeah, yeah. I, sorry, I wasn't. I wasn't suggesting in any way that uh, drawing down carbon with regenerative farming was the uh, I, uh, the only thing. You have got to do both, but it is more a case of because you mentioned about technology solutions in actually drawing down carbon. That was really um, the point. The point I had to make. Yeah. Um, however, there's also now a movement in agriculture called or starting in WA, Ag Zero 2030, where they're actually measuring their emissions uh, with a plan to reduce their emissions, methane yep. and otherwise. And then, of course, on top of that, um, through regenerative agriculture, actually draw down as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's uh, that's all good. I mean, I think stopping your, I mean, one of the critical things you've got to do is not put more into the atmosphere. So, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yep. Try and yep. stop that. Absolutely. And you know, we don't need more gas, coal, or oil projects. I mean, you know, why make it harder? That's one of our one of the complete contradictions in our national policy is that um, on the one hand, we're claiming all these great successes and renewables and so on, which has not really got much to do with government policy, frankly. And on the other, we're building massive new, you know, gas-led recoveries, and uh, I don't know how many coal mines we still have up for you know for approval. So there's a complete disconnect um, in the policy sense between yeah, absolutely yep. what we're doing, you know, on the one hand, and what the other hand is doing. Yep. Thank you, Bob. And one of the things that really interesting what you've just said is about that um, about agriculture, and of course, where we are in Bradfield and in, most of us are in Sydney. You know, we have the tall blue gum high forests that are, you know, really important 
for absorbing the carbon and the whole issue of forestry is something. Maybe Ian might like to pick up something like that while another question, we've got another question going ready to ask after that. The role of, I'm gonna ask Ian about the role of forest. Yeah, well, I mean, forestry is, uh, is also critical. I mean, one of the key tipping point issues that um, I mentioned is the Amazon. And there are great concerns at the moment. We are very close to the point where the Amazon, or if, if not already there, where the Amazon becomes a source of carbon for large parts of the year, as opposed to being a sink, which it has been historically. Now, it's those sort of big changes that can make a massive um, effect on the global system. Uh, which we really have to try and avoid happening. So you really need to stop deforestation. I mean, whether it's here or it's uh, in, a, you know, in um, Southeast Asia or the Amazon, it's critically important that we actually turn that around. Okay, another question. Yep, we've got Jill Green, from, who's the president of STEP. Over to you, Jill. Right, thank you. Very, very interesting, um, Ian, what you had to say. Uh, the Climate Council just brought out a new report called Aim High, Go Fast, and basically yep. with the same arguments that you've been making. One, one interesting thing that, that I, did, I didn't realise reading it, that um, once we get to net zero, the, uh, the effect on the temperature will be, be quite fast. Whereas you know, if, we could, if we say we um, continue on at our current path, <laughs> There's a lot of inertia built in the system, and, and temperatures will continue to rise. But if we went, if we get to a net zero, if I interpreted the, the um, report properly, when we get to net zero, the, the temperatures will start going down. And of course, it won't be fast, but it'll certainly they'll certainly start going down. Is that? Do you agree with that assessment? Or? Uh, well, I, it, uh, yes and no. I mean, if you get to net zero quickly, it will certainly enable temperatures to level off. But to get them to come down, you really are going to have to draw down carbon from the atmosphere. Um, to be quite honest, we don't really know because um, 420 parts per million is not a stable climate, which is where we currently are, of CO2, uh, which is why we have to pull it down toward 350. Now, it's really unclear as to quite how the, a lot of, a lot of work going into this at the moment, it's really quite unclear how fast that reduction may occur. I mean, the hope is obviously that if we have um, gone above, overshot 1.5, if we really move fast and get it to net zero, it will be possible to bend the curve and come down again. Um, but I'm not, you can't be too definitive about that at this point which is another reason for, uh, you know, taking urgent action and not um, <clears throat> not playing games and assuming you've got another 30 years to fix the problem. <clears throat> hey, yeah, the UK question. is doing a lot. The, the UK attitude is so different to, to what's happening in Australia. Yeah, I mean, they've um, made a massive investment in offshore wind. Um, they have, uh, some <clears throat> opportunity to genuinely um, use carbon capture and storage because of the North Sea oil rest by depletion, which and I mean carbon carbon capture and storage is one means of sequestration, which is you know we get talked about a lot here, but most of it only works if you have depleted oil and gas reservoirs in which to put the carbon dioxide, because we know that if you do that, you can secure them because that's the way oil was kept for you know, <clears throat> eons in that situation. It's a much bigger problem to put them into reservoirs that were not um, in that form originally. I mean, water aquifers or things of that kind, because you really have much less of a guarantee that you can actually secure them over the long term. Um, so the UK has you know, a few things going for it in that sense, but you're quite right. I mean, they have moved far more quickly than um, we're seeing in this country. We've got Did, other questions coming there's up. There's a question yeah. on geo yeah. Martin, Martin, yeah, over to you. Okay. Um, yeah, so my question comes um, probably as a result of uh, coming from the Upper Hunter by-election last Saturday, I think, 
um, in Coal Heartland where the Nationals were returned with um, uh, a significant uh, majority. Um, and most of the parties from Labor further right were all pro-coal. Um, and so the message of, of um, retooling or changing is just not cutting through in the Hunter. But um, the question for you, Ian, actually comes from discussion I had with you pr um, previously about um, your career history in a time where there was a need to move miners around um, to different locations. And I wondered if that might be a message that would help cut through um, that, um, you know, we're not necessarily saying that we have to stop mining, just that we have to stop mining fossil fuels. Um, could you give a bit more information on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the history of the coal mining industry, it's been through a lot of ups and downs um, over the years. And um, if you go back into the 80s, there was quite a lot of economic problem because of downturns in prices in Asia and so on. And uh, there was a, a lot of reorganization in the coal industry because of that. And people had to move from New South Wales to Queensland, from thermal coal to coking coal, um, what have you. Um, my experience has been that if you are very open and honest with the, the coal mining fraternity and they understand the problem, then they are extremely constructive in making these changes. And one of the dangers, of course, is that if you don't tell people what is really happening, then you end up creating a situation where you will get into big trouble and it will be almost impossible to make those changes constructively. You'll end up in a, a major standoff and a lot of people will get hurt. Now that's what's been going on in this country politically. I mean, neither side of politics have been, to be, have been prepared to be honest with the community about what is gonna happen. They should know perfectly well that the coal industry is going to be phased out. I mean, thermal coal will be phased out faster than coking coal because um, coking coal has a role in uh, steel making that we can't instantly replace. But it, it is actually starting to happen quicker than people thought, mind you. Um, the other side to the coin is that there is going to be big expansion in the um, low carbon technologies and low carbon industries, a lot of which is already occurring in the coal mining area. So really what should be happening is that we should have leaders getting out there saying, look, we can't do anything about the coal industry. It has to go. I mean, fossil fuels have been an enormous benefit to humanity over the last 150 years. But the point we knew that, that there was going to be a problem, we've known it for 50 years that this was going to happen at some point. It is now happening. Um, we've got solutions to the problem. A lot of those solutions are providing jobs in the, the coal mining areas and so on. What we need is leaders prepared to honestly face up to that, get out there and, 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 put, and, and articulate the solutions to it and the fact that um, new jobs are going to be available and to create the conditions that make sure that's happened. In other words, you put support into um, re-educating people, retooling those areas for the new technologies that are coming. And where you don't have solutions, and there may well be places where that doesn't, can't happen for whatever reason, then you help people to relocate and reorganize and what have you. But you've got to be brutally honest about the fact that you can't avoid it. And what we're doing is avoiding talking about it. So you look at mm -hmm. the other hunter, everybody's telling the coal industry, it's not a problem. You're going to be here forever and a day. There is no trouble, you know? Now that is absolute just lying to the community. Mm -hmm. It is totally irresponsible and both sides are doing it. Now we need different leaders prepared to get off that and start to, you know, articulate the real issues uh, uh, sensibly and and show people a way forward because you can't I mean it's all very well talking about the problem and I you know I've done mainly that this evening because we don't have much time but I mean we have a lot of the solutions components all there happening and you just need to put that all together into a way that um, people carry it forward mm. but I mean too many people in this community it's not just politicians it's the business community too 
and the investors have not been prepared to honestly accept that climate change was even happening. And I think, quite frankly, in our parliament today, and amongst some of our senior corporate directors, there are still far too many people who actually don't think climate change is real. Unfortunately, even in 2021, after everything that's happened, the bushfires, the drought, everything else you care to name, including the pandemic, which is actually climate related, um, they don't actually accept it. And that is a, a, an enormous indictment on the leadership of this country, frankly. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Christiane, over to you. Unmute. Sorry, I've got it. Um, yes, my question, my question is, uh, I've heard Ian talk about there are solutions and you know alternatives to coal mining and exploiting the petrol but what are they because i think perhaps that's the problem what are these new technical solutions i haven't really heard i've heard about the wind farms but what what are you proposing or what is available as an alternative <laughs> well to, so to, to, to bring carbon down and uh, you know, geotechnical or engineering alternatives, which I think Lexi was going to mention too. Yeah, well, firstly, um, renewables are now becoming far cheaper than existing fossil fuels. Um, solar, wind, tidal solutions, uh, the cost of that, I mean, so, and whether it's solar on the rooftop of houses or it's um, solar thermal, which are big solar stations, wind whether it's onshore or offshore um, all of these things are now moving ahead technically um, far faster than people expected in addition to that i mean you have the usual story from the prime minister that the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine and therefore we can't rely on this stuff um, you have storage so you now have batteries developing extremely quickly and that's happened in literally the last three or four years at scale it's starting to escalate you have um, to look very closely at energy efficiency. In other words, we shouldn't be using more of it. We should find ways of using less to produce the same productivity we like. And there are a whole pile of solutions in there which uh, have not really been applied anywhere near the same extent as the argument over whether we have coal or gas or renewables, right? But a lot has actually been happening behind the scene. You have electric vehicles coming in. Um, now, that's good and bad. I mean, uh, if it's coming from a renewable powered electrical source, that's good. Uh, if it's coming from a coal fired power station, it's not. Um, but even then, you have to say, well, do we need all those cars? I mean, what about bicycles and motorized scooters and all this sort of thing, which you now see happening around cities? If you go to Europe, you find that um, you know people increasingly are not actually owning cars anymore because they see alternatives. And we haven't done that in this country because we built out and not up, and uh, it's a different mindset. Um, same things happening around Asia. You have to think about it's not just the technical solutions; it's also lifestyle. I mean, you know, how do we live? I mean, what do we do with our urban environment? How do we build houses? Um, that's part of energy efficiency too. So it's, there is no silver bullet. I mean, this is this is a whole series of things right across the board that are going to involve um, major technical changes, but also lifestyle changes, societal changes, uh, the whole package of things that um, you can think about using energy, um, you know, essentially right through the food chain about how we how we, we eat the food we use etc cetera, etc cetera, whether it's no beef or otherwise um now this has to be what you have to have is a a national consensus that we have to look at this as a total package not just pick some pick bits and pieces out from the silos and do this bit or that bit you've just got to look at the whole system 
Uh, those things are now starting to be quite real. I mean, you know, they, it's happening. But the problem is that if we don't have a national leadership collectively accepting the, the challenge and pulling together all the threads to make it happen, mm -hmm. you end up with a far less optimal solution that we might actually achieve if we did have that leadership. And we, at the moment, politically, there is no leadership in this country on seriously addressing climate change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Lexi, did you want to? Um, yeah, hi there. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Hi, Ian. Thanks for your um, summation of the situation. Um, I was particularly interested in the geoengineering solutions that you sort of said you might discuss later. Yep. So um, if we could hear a little bit about that. And another thought of mine is that um, a lot of the solutions for our nation, because our um, leadership, our top-down leadership is failing, um, maybe the community-based and grassroots, like from the bottom up, is the way to make the changes, maybe um, by encouraging, you know, your local councils to commit to certain um, guidelines or, you know, promote that sort of thing within your community so that all the communities are working together and forcing it, which I know is already happening, but... Um, yeah, maybe push that idea a bit more. But really, I was thinking, I was interested in the geoengineering. Mm. Okay, well, the geoengineering <clears throat> is the last thing you actually want to look at. Yes. Because, um, <laughs> Dramatic solution. It's interfering with the, the world's climate system, human mm. interference. You don't always know what's going to happen. So you're playing an experiment, which may be completely irreversible. So you may stuff it up and get it wrong. Mm. But on the other hand, if you've left things so late that you run the risk of getting irreversible change or you can't stop the warming, then you may have no choice to, but to do that. Now, the sort of things that people have been looking at, particularly in the Arctic, um, the Arctic ice is melting, the sea ice is melting, which in turn triggers um, melt in the permafrost and melt in the Greenland ice sheet. And it has a major effect on the world's system. It's not; it doesn't just happen in the Arctic. It, it comes all around the world. Yeah. So it slows down the North Atlantic thermohaline conveyor, which keeps Europe warm because we've got cold water coming into the northern part of the Atlantic, and it, it slows that, stops that circulation. Um, so one of the things that people are looking at is how do you actually refreeze the Arctic? Can we actually apply techniques that locally um, will have an effect on refreezing it so that you stop mm. that sort of the change occurring? Mm. And is it possible to actually limit it seriously in, if you try to do that? Now, so David King, who I quoted earlier, has um, formed a group in Cambridge University in the UK called the Centre for Climate Repair. He's actually seriously looking at this stuff, not yes. in a sense of saying, well, we're going to do it tomorrow morning, but saying, look, is it actually practical to try and um, initiate anything like that? And we don't know yet. I mean, the, the answer is not, um, you know, it's not by any means clear. Um, there are other techniques where you spray aerosols into the atmosphere, a bit like you've seen coming out of um, fossil fuel power stations, for example, where they burn coal or oil. Which try, which actually slow down the the warming, but you you have a whole pile of legal problems. Then is that you know what if one country starts to do it, yeah. on the assumption that it'll just improve their situation and the whole thing goes across a whole other part of the world, yeah. um, what the legal ramifications of that, etc. Yeah, uh, there's ideas of um, increasing the iron content of the oceans to uh, increase the absorption of carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. It has worked in certain very limited circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole series of things of that kind that um, are being contemplated. Mm -hmm. But we just don't know whether it will work or whether it's legally feasible to do it. And you know, whether people will um, cooperate globally to achieve those things. Because the one of the big things that we have to really think about is that if you want to seriously address climate, you're not going to be able to do it by having the sort of belligerent nonsense that's been going on yeah. 
uh, you know, in, in threats to China and threats from China yeah. and so on, and the way we've seen it. I mean, our politicians are going to have to learn to stop poking sticks in people's eyes yeah. and cooperate in terms of how do we achieve this? I mean, China is now the world's biggest emitter, 20, I think 25% roughly of total global emissions. So the Chinese need to really move on this and to be fair to them, they are. I mean, they, they are, yeah. more than we have. Mm. Um, so, so, you know, for Australia to sit there and, and just assume that we can keep on pumping out fossil fuels while the rest of the world acts is completely unrealistic. Mm. Thank you, Ian. Um, we've got Thank you for that five explanation. Minutes, yeah, five minutes late. Uh, we've got, we're really nearly finished it. I want to ask Ian one final question, if I might, unless there's anyone really desperate to ask another question. One of the things is, Ian, when, we, um, when I come and listen to you, as I've listened to um, many other people talk about this crisis, um, what do we do next? You know, what, what is our responsibility now after this Zoom to really collectively act? And um, I feel that I, because I, I've said I want to stand as a candidate and I really want to start to do something because, um, so, um, you know, it's, it's sort of, yeah, what do we do next? I have, an, I have a few ideas about what to do next to build onto it. And probably I um, really need to sort of have another meeting to say a follow up meeting to get people together to say, what should we do? Does anybody have any good ideas about what we should do as a community in Bradfield? Well, just to maybe start it, um, Janine, the critical thing now is that we get more and more voices in the community demanding of the politicians that this be treated seriously. You know, this is not something you can sweep under the carpet any longer. Um, the school children have been making a hell of a noise about it, but let's face it, we started off well with a climate emergency um, position developing in 2019. It took a long time to get there, but we finally did. Uh, it's gone off the boil because of COVID to some extent, but also I think because we've had a lot of talk about declarations, um, you know, climate emergency declarations, what we haven't seen is action. And um, action is the only thing that matters in the end. So we, what we want is community advice is demanding it. I mean, we, it's not any longer good enough to just let this stuff slide by. So the more people are out there talking to the Paul Fletchers of this world about the fact that, um, uh, you know, things need to change, the better. All right. Well, I think that's a really good positive step to just finish with, that we do need to think about what we do need to collectively do, and action is the key. So I'll just say thank you very much, Ian, for coming and joining us. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Thank you for sharing your honesty Thank and you. your really brutal um, assessment of the failure of our political leaders and that we really have to um, act very, you know, we have to do our action. So thank you so much, Ian. It's a great honour. You are a local resident of Bradfield and you're sharing us with your knowledge and that's really important. So thank you for everyone who has joined us tonight and um let's give ian a clap and, and i would like to continue this whole but i will do it for an and I'd also like to thank Wayne Richmond, our Zoom host. Uh, thank you, Zoom. For, uh, thank you, Wayne, for yeah. holding this. It's been really terrific. And again, thank you to everyone who has joined me tonight. It is a really great honour and a great privilege. And I listen very uh, sincerely to what Wayne has said and his message. And I'm certainly going to go after Ian, tonight. Ian, Ian. Sorry, Ian. What did I, I, I didn't have a message. I didn't have a message. It was in. No, Ian had a message. Thank you, Ian. I certainly go away and think about your message, Ian, and we'll, we'll continue the conversation. So, 
Thank you again. And the, it's seven o'clock, and that's when we said we finished. So let's wave goodbye and say good night. And we need yes. to be brave and courageous and take action. This has been recorded. Janine will send out a link to on YouTube to where it is, so you can watch it later. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. Many thanks. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Thanks, Janine. Bye okay. Bye, everyone.